Right. So, um, welcome to this uh, lecture on, on, on the economics of, of science fiction. This is the first of our lectures on, on the topic. So, today we will be talking about dystopia. I will be first uh, talking briefly about what economics can tell us about science fiction and in the other way around. So, what the two have in common. And then from there, we will, we will start with the, talking about dystopias in, in, in particular for this week and uh, um, utopias next week. Okay? So here we go. So um, both uh, economics and science fiction have a lot of things in common, even though they may not uh, look like that. So first, um, you could say that fiction in general and economics have a lot uh, in common, because when you write fiction and you produce any sort of fiction, you have to make your world in principle credible. So you have to set a, 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 a lay a set of rules, and it's going to be necessarily a reduced version of the world. It cannot be the world itself. Okay, so you make some simplifying assumptions. In the case of science fiction, this is even more true because you are in principle creating societies that don't exist. So to make them credible, you have to. Uh, build the world, right? You have to engage in world building in a different scale. You have to create a world with certain rules and you have to uh, at, 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 long, uh, at least as long as you want to make it uh, credible, you have to abide to those rules. And actually many science fiction works starts with interesting premises that uh, are the basis for building uh, worlds that don't exist. So in that sense, economics also does that, right? So you set, a set a, an economic model where you make a simplifying assumptions and you stick to what are the implications of those assumptions. And secondly, in, in, the, in the subject matter, because both science fiction and economics are very interested in, on, on change and the consequences of change, especially about technological change and what would happen if there are certain changes, okay? So um, in this lecture and uh, in the next lecture, what we are going to be doing interchangeably, because there is, as you can see, there is a strong relationship because of these two reasons between science fiction and economics. Uh, we are going to be interchangeably going from, on the one hand, talking about how economics is at play in science fiction work. So we will see how economic principles, you don't need to know anything or very, many, many, anything in particular about economics to follow this. Uh, basic economic principles, how they are at work in science fiction works. And secondly, how science fiction can actually help us grasp new economic ideas. Okay, so it's not only that science fiction can help us learn economics, but actually, uh, or we can learn economics through, through science fiction, but actually science fiction can also bring new economic ideas. Okay? Right. So, before talking about what, um, how, what is the economics that we can find in science fiction, let me, so what the economics has to say about science fiction. So let's see how, or what science fiction has to say, what uh, science fiction has to say about economics. Okay? So this quote is from Kim Stanley Robinson. He's the author of many, uh, many fantastic books. Uh, Kim Stanley Robinson is one of the science fiction writers that probably thinks more like an economist. So take it as a good thing or a bad thing. Uh, I think it's a, in a good thing. Uh, he's also um, this, the student of, of Frederick Jameson, so this is an important uh, aspect of his work. And he says the following about economics in Red Mars. Uh, economics is about people arbitrarily or as a matter of taste, assuming numerical values to non-numerical things, and then pretending they haven't just made up the numbers. So economics in that sense is like astrology. Okay, so this is the typical take on economics uh, from, from science fiction. And there is some truth in this, but not necessarily, but there, are, uh, there is an interesting take. And so I thought that rather than starting from there, I was going to start uh, from the definition of economics itself, right? So we are gonna, I'm going to show you a couple of definitions you may be aware of. So one is from Lionel Robbins, is a, it was a, a, a British economist from the early 20th century, and he defined economics as the science which studies human behavior as a relationship between ends and scarce means that may have alternative uses. So you have a number of ends, things you want to achieve, you have square resources to achieve those ends, and economics studies how to, how to square the two things together. Another uh, uh, definition which is going to be very handy for us is by Richard Lipsy, who is an Australian, uh, Australian economist, 
and he defined economics as the study of the use of resource, uh, scarce resources sorry, to satisfy unlimited human wants. So the unlimited bit is uh, very heavily criticized by many people, so not necessarily human, wins, uh, human wants are unlimited, but take it as, you know, resources are scarce relative to human wants, right? So if human wants were not surpassing, so to speak, uh, the resources that we have, then resources wouldn't be scarce and there wouldn't be any economics. Okay, so these two definitions, as you can see, put a big emphasis on scarcity. Scarce resources, scarce means, actually to the extent that we could say that if there were no scarcity, there would be no economics, there would, not need, there would be no need to allocate scarce resources across different ends and objectives which enter into conflict with each other, right? If we could be here in this lecture and maybe be in at, at bed at the same time, then that would be great, but we have to choose one or the other, right? You could do this and that, you can go out, you can study, you can write for your, read for your essay, you can do many things, but there are 24 hours in the day, so you are choosing constantly what to do with your scarce resources, which are typically money, energy, and time, you know? Okay. Right, so our so, uh, 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 first response to that, which is the one we're going to be using all the time, is from Herbert Marcuse. Herbert Marcuse is probably the, the, the best or the most brilliant of the utopian thinkers, especially from the 60s, from the Frankfurt School. And uh, Marcuse thought a lot about many things related to scarcity and not directly economics as we understand it now, but uh, today or commonly, but many economic themes in, uh, at the end of the day. And he pointed out that, yes, all these definitions by economists are great, but actually scarcity is not just what he called a brute fact. It's a fact of life, not necessarily, right? Or maybe, but it is organized differently. So he said scarcity has throughout civilization, although in different modes, been organized. So society, uh, scarcity not, just not happen, or maybe it happens, but it's not the end of the story. So scarcity is organized, scarcity is distributed, okay? And how to overcome it, all the ways in which scarcity is distributed and uh, individuals are asked or, or compelled to overcome it and societies, those have been created by human societies and have been imposed over individuals. That is Marcuse's view on, on economics. So yes, economics is there, there's a scarcity, but that doesn't mean that it's just a brute fact, right? So actually, if you put the two things together, then it's easy to see what's the relationship between economics and dystopia. Because at the end of the day, what dystopia is, is nothing but different ways of organizing, managing, and distributing scarcity, okay? So we could have, uh, dystopias in, if you want, a uh, continuum between the brute, the brute fact of uh, scarcity, when it happens and that's it, something that is there, imposed on people by, if you want, nature. And on the other hand, uh, that would be, for instance, post-apocalyptic post dystopias, uh, la Mad Max, right? So there's a nuclear holocaust and there's very little food, or there are zombies out there, or an alien invasion, that's not something that so it comes out and then we explore how we organize scarcity in that case. Or we could go to very complex societies, very complex economies, like for instance, totalitarian economies, where either governments or corporations are the ones managing scarcity. Okay? And that is Kohagen, this is the governor of Mars in Total Recall, where actually has control over air. Uh, imagine, right? Scarcity of air. That's not that's something we tend to take as given not in London where there's a lot of pollution, but you know, there's a monopoly over air. That's what Kohagen has, right? So the, the disturbances we're gonna see in today's lecture are somehow in this, in, this, in this spectrum between the brute force and the total and complete management of scarcity, right? So let's start with post-apocalyptic economies. So I understand that there is some, um, um, people who may disagree that post-apocalyptic fiction is a dystopian fiction, so some people think, or the science fiction even, so some people just claim that it's a speculative fiction. So for today's purposes, I'm gonna include post-apocalyptic uh, dystopias as, or economies as part of dystopias, okay? Even though it's true that there's nothing like, you know, 
uh, Orwellian in, 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 for instance, the road. In the road, as you know, based on the uh, Cormac McCarthy novel, some unknown uh, catastrophe has happened that basically has rendered uh, the world completely sterile. It's an extremely bleak view because there's very little hope, uh, very little uh, hope that things will get better in any way. Um, and, and the thing is that, you know, the economies of, of the kind we observe every day, in our day, everyday life collapse completely, uh, but that doesn't mean that economics stops. Actually, economics has become more important than ever. Because now, because there is so much scarcity, then economic decisions are incredibly important and stark, right? Basically between death and survival. You have to find food, you have to produce it potentially, you have to defend yourself, right? So the things that happen in, uh, the, the things that uh, uh, post-apocalyptic economies lack, which we see right now in our standard economies, are things as basic as property rights, there's no specialization. I'll go and detail about this, these factors in a second. Of course, there's no money, or not fiat money. By fiat money, remember, it's just the pounds that we have in our accounts. Money is backed by central banks. There are basically no markets in the way we see it, anonymous markets. Of course, there are some markets. We will see some examples. And there's no rule of law, at least at the very beginning. So certainly in the road, which is probably the starkest, the sparsest economy I can think of, where well, there is nothing, right, almost nothing, uh, just people with their trolleys pushing and trying to get stuff, even though there are some very nasty bands out there, there's basically no, nothing, right, everything is grey and burned, okay? Right, so, of course, no, no, not having property rights is incredibly important for an economy, and you can see that, so by contrast, by looking at how lack of property rights actually impact apocalyptic economies, right? So. Insecurity of property distorts economic decisions incredibly, to a, to a great extent, okay? To an immense extent. Why? Well, first, when there is insecurity, there is a constant threat of expropriation, right? So you have to defend yourself. So why are you gonna produce something that someone else can take? Why are you gonna innovate in, let's say, some agricultural procedure that you found out, even though it was very well known, but you know you rediscovered in after the apocalypse. Why are you going to be doing that if this is going to be taken from you potentially? Okay. So actually, this insecurity, what it does, is to perpetuate scarcity because there is very little incentive to generate any kinds of surplus. Okay. Right. Then, of course, human capital, which is another source of economic growth, well, is distorted as well because on the one hand, I could learn myself to, to, to um, I, could, I could try to learn to tend the, the land and produce uh, vegetables or perhaps some cattle if there is, uh, some if, if, it, if there is the possibility. But at the same time, I have this threat of expropriation. Probably what I want to learn is how to fight and how to defend myself, okay? So combat training or being at, at combat is very important, so you don't learn stuff that which may be productive, so you don't accumulate productive human capital, you accumulate human capital that can help you to protect yourself, uh, or maybe attack others, right? Maybe you want to become a great warrior that will be able to expropriate others, maybe, okay? Um, and then there is also important uh, distortions on the production of capital goods, that is goods where you have to invest, and that give you a return later, because by the, uh, by also because of the problem of, uh, of insecurity, many capital goods that will be produced, if not all, will be on defense or attack. So either you will have people who will specialize on attacking and they will create these cars with all this armor, new weapons, and that's it, and they are using their ingenuity to produce that in that time, not to tend the land, or even if you want, you want to protect from, from zombies, you will have to, to, to build walls and fortresses. That's time that you are not using uh, into producing stuff and, and cookies and carrots and, and vegetables, okay? So actually, all these are just extreme versions of what happens in developing economies with uh, weak states, where there is no protection, no courts, of, or not, uh, no, no enforcement of property. You have to devote, if you are, let's say, a family uh, in, in, in some developing country, you have to spend a lot of time trying to fence off potential thieves and making sure that you have 
uh, that no one steals from you, you not even maybe the government, okay? So there are, it is not that different from this type of economies. Of course, post-apocalyptic economies are an extreme version. Now, there is no specialization, right? So uh, one thing that we uh, take for granted in our societies is that we are hyper-specialized. So I'm a hyper-specialized person. I, I can deliver lectures more or less entertainingly, right? But don't ask me to, to go with, the, with some goats or cows or to milk a cow or to... That I cannot do. Because there's someone else who will catch the fish, who will produce the meat, and so on and so forth. And we benefit greatly from that. Now, after the apocalypse, so for instance, the family in a quiet place, they have to learn everything. They have to learn to produce vegetables. They have a family. So they have to do that after the aliens invade. Right? So, you have people who may not be that good or have to learn, so actually uh, producing land and producing food, right? Now, many jobs, of course, become obsolete. Uh, so I would be the first person to become obsolete if there is a zombie apocalypse, for instance. And there is a need for retraining, right? So it is an interesting uh, take that is not in the film, uh, in the book World War Z, where there's this zombie apocalypse and, you know, you do one, the, the government would still stand have to create this retraining program for CEOs and executives and, and salespeople. Because, of course, they cannot fight, they cannot, so they have to be retrained. This is uh, from uh, a French uh, series, which I would recommend quite uh, fondly, which is called The Collapse, or L'Enfrontement, uh, right? Uh, where there is, in one of the episodes, there are people who come to this village, which is self-organized, and the first question that they ask is, what, what was your profession? Are you a carpenter? Are you? And one says, no, I was selling printers. Um, yeah, there's no printers uh, in the apocalypse, right? Uh, and then, of course, trade becomes very difficult. So, because of the insecurity that we just said, right? So, one, we are going to go back to this idea of a specialization in trade. So, you will like maybe this village has a lot of people who are very good at, 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 at cattle or, or, or they have cows and they know how to do, to deal with those. Maybe there's a village next door which is very good at producing vegetables. Potentially, they could trade, they could specialize and trade between the two, but it's very difficult. You don't trust other people. There may be uh, hostiles out there. So trade is very complicated. So there's this push for self-sufficiency, right? Which is something which is not good, great from the economic perspective. So it's good to ensure some, some level of, of, of welfare, but not, uh, not great because you are producing things which are you're not good at. Okay, uh, but there is an interesting uh, element, of course, which is that when there is these external threats, be it aliens or viruses or zombies or whatever, then there is uh, an inducement for cooperation. So we, we, we know, and there are some theories out there, that humans are cooperative because we, um, uh, we found that that was a very good uh, tool when fencing potential threats, right? So a war would be the, uh, it's called the mother of altruism. Okay, these are some, some theories. And then you can see that even in the, in the post-apocalypse, even when you, you went in, in Mad Max or even in the road, there are bands of people who organize themselves. They don't fight each other. So it's not the Hobbesian war of everybody against everybody. So people coming into groups and specializing in uh, appropriation, they don't kill each other and they kill others. Right? So even if it's in that negative way, if you want, there is clearly room for uh, cooperation. Now, there's no money, there's no fiat money, because there's no central authority to back paper money. Okay, this is a, recent, a relatively recent invention. So what happens is that there is a reversion to an economy with no money. And what is an economy with no money and no trade? So what is an economy with no money and no trade? It's just a pillage economy where I get, I take things from you, and that's it. That's all there is. That's all the trade that there is. It's not voluntary, and it's extremely bad, as you can see, for economic efficiency or, or, or output, right? So these are the, the most basic ones. But then, of course, naturally, there is barter emerges. And you can see this in Mad Max 3, beyond the Thunderdome. There is this town called Barter Town, which obviously it is for there. That's where you barter stuff. Now, as you know, or as you may know, the problem with barter is the problem of the double coincidence of the size. So I want tomatoes, and you have tomatoes, and I have uh, carrots, but you don't want carrots. So we cannot trade, right? Because I want what she has, but she doesn't want what I, uh, what I have. So we have to find somewhere else, someone else. Maybe we, have a, we, we need a change of, of, of trades. 
but unless we have this double coincidence of ones, then trade barter is not that great. And actually, there is anthropological evidence showing that there's no really complex civilization that has been based on barter, right, because of this complication. Now, naturally, there are some uh, economists, post-apocalyptic economists, that uses currencies with intrinsic value, which was the next uh, uh, stage in the evolution of money. So for instance, this is from Waterworld. Waterworld is a 94 film where you know the, the, the world has been covered by water. And, um, and the most the, the, the currency that is used is sand, land, dry land that people have. So people use that to trade. So I can buy stuff by giving you a little bit of, of, of sand. But actually, you can also use this land to produce plants, right? So it has intrinsic value. It's the same as gold or as salt, right? You can use it also to create ornaments or to uh, preserve food. And that's why money was based on gold and salt in ancient times. So this is a reversion to very basic, basic, uh, 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 very basic uh, uh, ways of, of forms of money. So as you can see, the, the post-apocalypse help us a lot to go to very basic economic concepts, right? And then, of course, there's no rule of law. There is no court system, nothing enforceable, really. So if you have a contract with someone, then you cannot go to the court and say, look, this person renege on the contract that I write with them. OK, so that doesn't exist anymore. Uh, but what we have is that there is some degree of governance emerging from the ashes of civilization. So here we have a few examples. We will talk about Immortal Joe. Uh, uh, for a little while later. This is on uh, Auntie whatever, I don't remember, Tina Turner in, in, in Mad Max, the creator of Battletown. And this is this guy, I don't remember, but it's from the book of Ellie. Of course, it's Gary Oldman, but I don't remember the name of the character. Uh, and this, uh, these characters, these leaders, create uh, what is called command economies, right? So command economies are not market economies. So basically, a command economies is whether it's a person or a group of people, small, that tell everybody what they have to eat, buy, produce, and so on and so forth. OK? So these uh, leaders have monopolies of maybe these three things, or at least some of them. So coercion, of course, they have the monopoly of violence to start with. They have weapons. So for instance, in Barter Town, the first thing that you have to do when you enter the city is to leave your weapons. Uh, key commodities, we will see that in the case, particularly in the case of, of Immortal Joe. And beliefs, also in the case of Immortal Job, maybe you have a belief on, 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 on the leader being that divine or having special powers, and that gives you also power, right? And that's actually one of the sources of power of Immortal Job, right? And this is the key thing, that's where scarcity enters again. These leaders, because they have these monopolies over these key resources, they regulate their availability to maintain their power. You can see that, especially, in Max Fury Road, and it, let's la have a look at the economics of it, how the economy of, of, of that world is organized. Okay? So the, the economy that we see in Max Fury Road is based on three monopolies. Okay? The first one is the one by Morton Joe that actually controls water and also the milk from the mothers and the blood uh, that extracts from slaves to provide to the, to the warrior boys. Uh, the second is the people eater, who has the, uh, the monopoly over gasoline, right? It's, uh, uh, of course, you know what is fuel, right? And the bullet farmer who has uh, a monopoly over ammunition. So the first thing is that there is a specialization. So you can see there is already some, economic go uh, some standard economies going on here. There is a specialization. The three cities specialize each in the production of each of the three. They have a monopoly. They trade among themselves. So very basic in the trade theory, specialization and trade. Okay? But the key thing is that these people have control over that. They trade because it's in their interest. So of course, the Immortal Joe needs ammunition to keep his coercive power. And certainly, the bullet farmer needs gasoline to run his vehicles, and, and so on and so forth. So they need each other, but they have control over, over that. right? So the, for instance, you can see this command economy at work uh, in the Citadel, which is the city of Immortal Joe, which is, has a very <laughs> standard py uh, pyramidal structure with Immortal Joe and his most uh, close acolytes at the top. Then you have the war boys, which are below, which are really important for coercion. They are um, also believers on Immortal Joe's powers, 
right? So there's also the belief, in, uh, the belief uh, monopoly there. Then you have producers like the mothers who produce milk and the slaves who operate the different the leaf and different technologies that exist in the in the in the citadel. And then you have the wretched which are there just waiting for immortal Joes to open the gates and give them a little bit of water. And this is the key thing. Actually, it's difficult to think, even though we will see another one, a better metaphor of trickle-down economics, because as you can see, resources are trickling down from the top, literally, to the guys at the bottom. OK? Now, as you can see, dystopias are organizations of scarcity. Again, so another one organization is horizontal organization, right? So we could have a horizontal dystopia. That's a snow piercing, right? So if in a snow piercing, if you, if you are familiar with that, you should. It's a train where all the survivors from climate collapse have been, uh, have been put there. This is a non-stopping train. It's always there. It's a command economy. There's no markets. There are no prices. So um, uh, there is, it's completely segregated. Right, because what you have is that the rich are at the front, uh, front car uh, at the front uh, carriers, right? Carriages, sorry, that's the word, uh, and, and the leader is there at the front, okay? And the poor people are at the back, okay? And actually, they are a reserve army. If you would want to be a bit Marxian, they are a bit reserve army of, of workers that have nothing. They are very extremely poor, right? Now. This, is more, this is situation is maintained, first because there is indoctrination of the middle classes um, um, about they may be going up or horizontally to the front, and also there are beliefs and, and, and indoctrination of the lower classes imposed by, you know, the magical locomotive and the front carriages and the train and, you know, some religious beliefs are fed, right? There is almost no social mobility. Sometimes some people from the poor uh, carriages are taken to work in the middle ones, okay? But as you can see, uh, it is a very strict class structure, okay? Now, a question in the, se in the seminar is about whether this is a reflection of the state, of capitalism, or the, what is this a metaphor of, right? But as an economy, it's very clear it's a command economy with a very rigid structure and very little social mobility, okay? So this, if you want, is the horizontal version of your Morton Joe's Citadel, right? Now, another organization, again, vertical one, but literally, again, is from this Spanish film, The Platform. Uh, so in The Platform, it has a very interesting premise. So every day, at level zero of this facility that has, I don't know how many hundreds of floors, there is this very big platform full of food that starts descending, right? People are located at the different levels of this facility. Of course, if you are at the top, that's great. You will get a lot of food. But if you are at the bottom, hmm. So in principle, and this is something that the creators of the platform make very explicit, there is food for everybody, right? But, and this is the moral story, the moral of the story, the gluttony and the greed of the people at the top means that at the end, at the bottom, there's almost no food left, and actually people start to resort to violence and all kinds of things. Okay? Now, uh, of course, this is interesting for many reasons. One that I find in, uh, very interesting is that from time to time, I think it's uh, every month, if you survive, you get reallocated to a new floor. Okay? So tomorrow I might be in a low floor, if today I'm at a high floor, and so on and so forth. Now, in principle, this is an implementation of the Rawlsian veil of ignorance. So in case you, I guess you are familiar with this, is the idea that fairness can, has to be thought as, you know, you can occupy any, any place in society, so you have to, it's a way of thinking, to putting yourself on what society you want, if instead of where you are stand, you were to stand somewhere else, right? So by making this exercise, you can create some sort of, um, of fairness. But actually, this is not what happens in the platform. So what happens is that people who are at the bottom, and next time that they are at the top, they don't realize, oh, I, I would like the guys at the bottom to get some food because I've experienced that myself. No, they behave as badly or even worse than, than, than other people. Okay, so actually it's counterproductive, the role cell veil of ignorance. Of course, this is an obvious metaphor of trickle-down economics, this idea that if the ones at the top are, are, are well off, then those at the bottom will be better off as well. Uh, this is an obvious metaphor, maybe even Introduction to metaphor, uh, 
material. But you know, there is also an interesting uh, interpretation as natural resources. Think of, of these levels as generations, right? So we, we, uh, my generation inherits the earth with a number of resources, and I, we consume some, maybe more, and we pass it to the next generation, OK? And is it more, is it less? We, we could have for everybody, enough for everybody, but mm, this doesn't seem to be happening, OK? Now, actually, in all these dystopias that we have uh, browsed so far, you can see that in the platform, it's not very clear who's at the top or whether who, who is the elite, some kitchens and some cooks, but it's very unclear because that's not the purpose of the film. But, you know, uh, in all these films, the guys at the top are not that well off, right? So Morton Joe, yes, but, you know, he's really old and, 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 and decrepit and all that, so they are not that well off. In absolute terms, in relative terms, they are incredibly better off than the rest, but in absolute terms, eh, not so much, okay? So now let's consider some utopia, uh, dystopia, sorry, where the rich are actually so well off that they don't face any meaningful scarcities. Right? They, don't, they don't have any constraints. They actually live in a, if you want, communistic society or in a post-scarcity society as the, of the types we will see in next lecture, okay? And if you think about it, it's not that dissimilar to our own world. Um, if you, uh, uh, so this is William Gibson, who actually quote, has this very famous uh, quote by him that, is, that he says that the future is already here, it's just unevenly distributed. And actually, if you go you know, to Waterloo Bridge and you look to the left, you see the city with these wonderful skyscrapers that seem to come from 22nd century. But if you take the tube and you go to North Kensington, highest poverty rates in the country, right. The future is here, but then evenly distributed, right? So this is a way of, of, of seeing science fiction as well. Right, so one of these instances is, of course, the Hunger Games, um, the political economy of, of Panem. Panem is the country uh, of, the, of, of, well, the new United States become Panem, right? And the economy of Panem actually adopts extreme, an extreme version of this specialization of trade theory of uh, David Ricardo and the idea of comparative advantage, okay? So uh, maybe you are familiar, but if you are not, th this is what the theory says. Uh, basically, I've already outlined that. The idea is that each district specializes on the production of a commodity that is the, the one that they have a, 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 an advantage at producing. So in the case of the Katniss uh, district, I think it's District 12, is coal, right? But in others, it's timber or fish or whatever. So they produce only that. They specialize on that. And then the district sends the output to the capital, which is the central, it's a command economy again, uh, in exchange for protection, right? So it's not in exchange for other goods, but in exchange for protection. So of course, the districts are extremely poor, uh, and the capital people live wonderfully. They have TV shows and dress in all these flamboyant styles. They have a hedonistic lifestyle. Whereas as I was saying, the districts live in abject poverty, because actually, there is none of the mechanisms that should be in place where there is a specialization of trade, right? So one of the uh, main problems with David Ricardo's theory of trade, and fair trade is based on that and those ideas as well, is that when you have a country that specializes in the production of something, then all the other sectors are supposed to close down or to have very minimal presence, so many people get unemployed. Now, how, how uh, and then of course it's true that the cake increases for everybody, so because every country specializes in the production of the things that they are better at producing, then the size of potential world economy increases in size quite dramatically, but the distribution is an important aspect, right? So there are things that you have to do if you want to compensate those who uh, lose from that specialization. So maybe the capital could produce some transfers, could give money or some other goods, some of the goods from other, from other, from other districts to the districts so they don't starve. Or maybe they could allow the districts to um, to trade among themselves, right? Or maybe there could be even gains from, from, from specialization if movement of people were allowed. So maybe I live in District 12, but I'm a lousy miner. Actually, I'm potentially a very good fisher, but I'm not allowed to move to another district where fish is, pro is being produced. So actually, even the output is harmed. Total output is even harmed by the absence of, 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 of movement, right? So if I'm Spanish and the Spanish economy is specialized in tourism, but I'm good at delivering lectures, hopefully. 
then I will have to, it's better if I move to a country where lectures are taken more seriously or, you know, where there's a specialization on education, right? Right? So these are things that, that could happen, right? But scarcity is not organized or managed in this way. It's organized in a different way so that the capital enjoys all these resources. And, of course, we get to uh, in, in time where in this film, which is very unfairly neglected and considered, time, uh, money is replaced by time. So what happens is that uh, at 25, you stop aging, that would be great, but then you have in your arm a clock that tells you how much life, uh, life you have left. And when you spend, when you buy stuff, then you lose time. Okay, so you buy a coffee, it's four minutes. If you go and buy a bus, it's 30 minutes. If you buy a car, it's 59 years. And when it gets to zero, end of the story, right? So buying something costs you literally time, right? So we have this typical uh, metaphor for time is money, which it is, right? So if you want to buy something, you probably will have to work. You have to spend some time to get and some wage. Literally here, we dispense with the work side, and we just go to the time. Right? Of course, you accumulate, well, you dispense with the money, sorry. So you have the time already. So if you work or, or produce something or you sell it, you get more time. Okay? Now, it is a, a very unequal society where you see that the poor, the mass, vast majority of people running everywhere because they don't have much time, right? They cannot afford uh, just walking or taking the bus. So they are running everywhere. And because they live, they are break even, just breaking even, right? So if they don't get paid, they die, right? And on the other hand, you have the rich, which they have all the time they want. So actually, they don't have actually a constraint. They are de facto immortal. They have so much time that they can do whatever they want. This is also an economy or a, or a political economy that enforces strong segregation. So there are time zones. Right? So there is a spatial segregation as well. If you want to move from a poor neighborhood to a rich neighborhood, if you want to move to North Kensington to the city, then you have to uh, spend time. The, the, the price is so high that actually there is no mobility. So you can do it. It's not enforced by coercion, but you know, you, you die if you, if you move from one uh, time zone. It's a funny take on time zones from to the other, right? This is a command economy, actually, in the sense that there is no uh, a price system. The price is fixed by elites. So actually, in a passage of the, of the film, uh, price levels are used as a way of uh, squashing a, a revolt. Okay. Um, and inflation is literally lethal, right? Because when prices go up, then you want to buy your coffee or your, or, or your, or your, or your trip, and then you die. Okay. Now, of course, uh, in, the, in the context of uh, climate collapse and, 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 and climate change, there is also survivalism for the rich in the sense that the rich are those who have the power to isolate themselves or hide themselves from the consequences of climate collapse. And that is something that is very apparent in Elysium, right? Where the elites, it's not that they live in gated communities, they live in the space, okay? And they have basically immortality again because they have these med bays, which are these um, automated health systems where you get into these things and these boxes and then you get cured for everything. It is not by chance that this film came out at the time of the debate on Obamacare. Not by chance, okay? And of course, the, what happens is that the rest of the people live in, in Earth, which is extremely crowded and polluted. It's basically a concentration camp. Unlike in the Hunger Games, you don't see the poor people producing stuff for the rich. Actually, what they seem to be producing is robot police, which is the, the enforcers of this system and other types of, of weapons. So actually, they are producing the means of their own coercion, right? Uh, oh, by the way, it's not either by chance that uh, the, the character by Jodie Foster, who is the the president or director of, of Elysium has all the stylists and clothes and, 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 and hair is from the same as Christian Lagarde, the president of FMI at the time. So, you know, 101 metaphor again. Um, so he's there if you want to see it, but it's really on, on, the, on, on, your, on your nose. 
Uh, it's very unclear why the rich need the poor in this economy. Very unclear. So that's why we have a seminar question on that. So it is so unclear why the rich need that, need the poor, that actually there is this extreme version of a dystopia, which is exterminism. So the, probably the most exterministic, uh, if that is a word, uh, dystopia is the purge. In the purge, basically what happens is that the rich realize that policing and repressing the poor is too costly. So what they do is, or if they want to, to, to not to police them, they will have to increase the welfare state. But of course, that raises taxes in no way. So they institutionalize murder one night a year. Murder is legal. And what happens in the purge is that because uh, the poor cannot afford means of protection, they are gradually exterminated. And across the four movies, you see, and there's a TV series as well, you, there are many references to unemployment and poverty levels being low. There is the common discourse that is because people have released their libidinous uh, energies and have released tensions, but actually it's just because the poor are killed. They are not there, so they are not in the statistics. Now, you may say, well, this is uh, Marxian crap and there is nothing, but actually this ties in with another important aspect we are going to see in, uh, next, which is IP. Now, think on insulin prices, right? So diabetes, as you know, is a disease that has an extreme vector, socioeconomic vector, so people with poor, low income are much more affected by diabetes than people, than richer people. And I don't know if it's motivated by the purge or not, uh, if the purge is motivated on this or not, but you know, this is the price of insulin in the US. Has, as you can see, incredible increase over the last 20 years, and is the US is an outlier. So, you know, not necessarily that people in a room think we have to kill the poor, no, but it's true that certain decisions about scarcity, and IP is one of them, are important and can lead to this type of dynamics. Okay? Right. So, yeah. Anyway, another source of, of dystopias, now moving if you want, we are moving to the most organized in the, in the spectrum from the post apocalypse to the apocalyptic to those that have more uh, complex governance structure, are corporate dystopias. Of course, there were some corporate dystopias in the 50s, 60s, and 70s, but actually when they take form is in the 80s, after the conservative revolution of Thatcher and Reagan. And what you see is that the distrust on the government, that is typically Orwellian or Huxley, a brand new world, is substituted by distrust on corporations. So what you have is cyberpunk emerging at that time. It's a defining trope of, 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 of cyberpunk and key novels, of course, Blade Runner, the film, is in 82, but this is 84, William Gibson, we just saw it, Neuromancer, creator basically of the cyberpunk uh, genre, and some other very important novels from the 80s and 90s that reflect this idea. And actually corporate dystopias are quite cool in some sense, because they give us fantastic graphism like this one. So these are logos from uh, fictional corporations, from dystopian films. Do you recognize any of this? The Umbrella Corporation. Uh, this is by and large from Wally, -E, exactly. It's the Umbrella Corporation from Resident Evil. Uh, this is Alien, of course. They were in Utani. Sol and Green, the Solent Corporation, yes. Yes, Mr. Robot, very good. Uh, this is from Robocop. Okay. This is from Blade Runner, the Tyrell Corporation. This is from Terminator. And this is from The Fifth Element. So cool, right? Uh, oh, by the way, this is from a rollerball. It's a quite um, pioneering um, uh, corporate dystopia from the 70s. Now, corporate dystopias uh, um, typically are defined by these de delocalized mega corporations that supersede governments. Governments are much less powerful. Corporations are based in different countries. They don't respond to governments. Actually, in Kim Stanley Robinson trilogy, mass trilogy, they are called transnats for transnationals or mega transnats, okay? Uh, they control key resources or sectors like robotics or AI, off-world colonization, uh, 
uh, cloning and all kinds of things. This is very important because they control again. They have a monopoly and produce scarcity over something. So these technologies are not freely available because the corporations control them. And you could see this as an extreme version of the neoliberal project where there is the free market and there was no intervention, no tax section, no antitrust policy that was good enough or that was enacted to avoid these kinds of, of, of corporations, right? Now, again, this may seem uh, far-fetched, but in our own world, we can see these forces, right? So some of them are technological, so there are economies of scale. So for instance, you, you get a lot as a firm by integrating a number of services. So for instance, we tend to think as Google as a search engine, but actually the most revenues they get is from ads, okay? Our network externalities, Network externalities, again, is something that happens. This is the value of the use of a product increases as the number of people using it increases. So of course that, instead of fragmentation, this leads to everybody using the same thing because it's the value of everybody, all of us using the same search engine, the same operating system, and so on and so forth. And then of course, the other important thing is that maybe you want to call these things as a government, but there are tax havens. Maybe you want to raise, raise corporate taxes or, but then people, uh, firms can move to tax havens. Okay, so it's very complicated to, to, to call these, these things, right? So again, going back to our friend Marcuse in his other uh, interesting book, The End of Utopia, he wonders, uh, after seeing all this, he wonders the following. So in the 60s, especially at the end of the 60s, he said, okay, now we have at our disposal all the technological means to abolish hunger, misery, poverty, and even alienating labor, maybe not at that time that much, but clearly now, right? So the question is, why is that we haven't seen the end of scarcity? Why is that we are not living in utopia right now? And his answer is that the same technologies that could be liberating, or technological advances that could be liberating us in all these aspects, actually are used to perpetuate scarcity and need. Okay? So in that sense, when he means the end of utopia, it means that this situation of post-scarcity, of no scarcity, is no longer unattainable. It's, a, it's attainable, right? And, and, the, and, the, and the, the striking fact is that, despite that, um, we don't see that, that end. Okay, so I'm gonna rush a little bit over this, of course, this goes back, this idea goes back to uh, the Huxley and Or Orwell uh, debate, the contrast between soft repression and hard repression. So in both these dystopias, technological advancements are used to maintain the status quo. So in that sense, are a representation of what Mark Huser said. So of course, in, in, in Orwell is surveillance, media, people are fed with stories which are fake, the past is changed, and in the case of Brave New World, hypnosis, drugs, conditioning, all kinds of psychedelics are fed to people. Right, this is far-fetched, but actually in, in the real world, there are two technologies that are used to preserve the status quo if you want to preserve scarcity, which are IP, intellectual property, and social scores. Okay, I'm going to, um, so of course, uh, yeah, I don't have, I'm running a little bit, but anyway. So, the first one is, is very easy to understand, is IP, when you have copyright, all these technologies which could be great, are not accessed by everybody, cannot be accessed by everybody, right? So the med base in Elysium, there's a question mark on whether actually everybody could have them or not, but if you see the film, it's not that clear, so maybe everybody could have that, right? And there is no reason, I don't see any reason in, in time, why the poor cannot also have unlimited time, in the comic Transmetropolitan, there is something that we will see, a technology similar to the one we will see in Star Trek uh, in the next lecture, which is the replicators. You can produce stuff, but actually these replicators, these mark makers, need some software, some code, some blueprints of the thing that they want to replicate. So let's say a chicken, right? So you need the code so the maker makes a, a roast chicken, but the, the blueprints from the chicken are copyright. Right? So you cannot, you cannot have a chicken. You have to pay for that. And then that's something that will be very relevant for you guys is premium AI. So you can see it already in ChatGPT, 
it is premium one you have to pay and, and, and a one that is free. And guess which one is better, right? So if you want to write your essay using ChatGPT, it's going to be better if it is the premium version than it is the non-premium version. And that's going to generate a lot of inequality, right? Because if you write better essays, you get better marks, and if you get better marks, right? That's the idea, no? So as you can see, IP can generate inequality. And finally, let's talk about social scores. Okay, this is a very big topic and it's starting to attract some attention. This is Jean Tirol, the Nobel Prize winner in economics, has written a wonderful paper on that, very complicated to read. <coughs> Let me just skim it. So this idea is that social scores can be used to uh, tackle behavioral externalities. So for instance, behavioral externalities means behaviors that for you produce something that for other people produce something else. So for instance, when you play your music in your party, you enjoy it, but that's noise for the neighbors, right? When you help people uh, because maybe you feel good or you are doing something like playing a nice instrument in the street because you enjoy it, but also you are producing something positive to other people, so behaving well is a positive externality. Behaving badly, speed driving and things like that is a negative externality. So in principle, thanks to the flow of social information, we may know when someone does something that we don't like or that we like, and actually we could use social scores to reward that or to punish that, right? So you can just have a social score that tells you that you have, I don't know, 200 because you have been great to your neighbors, you have paid everything, you have behaved in the right way, in a pro-social way, but uh, yeah, you can also be getting, be, you can also, if you have a low score, that means that you are an antisocial person. Actually, this can even be paired with benefits and sanctions of different kinds. So discounts if you are well behaved or price premium if you are not well behaved. You can even have purchase restrictions, so maybe you cannot buy a car or a, or a house if uh, you don't have a good, a good enough score. So actually, as you can see, this combination of material and immaterial sanctions based on the idea that we as humans, we care about what other people think about us, about us uh, are, is very powerful, right? Because, you know, if you have a social score, and we have some already, and I'm not necessarily talking about China, of course, but I'm even in, in here in the West, we have, you know, number of followers on Twitter or whatever, right? So um, these social scores can be good, right? If the externalities we are talking about generate are, are very large, right? Then actually having regulating the behavior of people, of course, that may be problematic. But, they, but having just a social score, just having something that everybody can see, can have a positive effect. That's what Tirol shows. If, they, if we are talking about externalities which are very small, then that's not so, OK? Then that's not that clear. The totalitarian or if you want dystopian problem emerges when there is bundling. So when you have a regime or a firm that can bundle pro-social behavior with its own objectives, right? So what if you get a social score not only for driving safely, but also for not dissenting of the government, for not criticizing the government or for not doing whatever, okay? Then when you see a social score, you don't know whether this person uh, is, has a 100, which is great, because this person was a nice, a nice person, or just because it he or she complied with uh, the government. Now, what it all shows is that this is more likely to happen, this uh, totalitarian bundling in autocratic regimes, in weak tie societies. So actually, people will get most of your inf of information about you through the social score, but not because they know you, not because they are your friends, because their friends will know what you do and they will be able to tell whether it is because you were nice to the government or nice to the people in general, and when there is no competition from private scores. Because then in that case, the private scores can unbundle the, the social score. And of course, there are problems of guilt by association, so you can even construct social scores when if you are nice to someone with a low score, you get a low score. And that is a very powerful, a very powerful tool. Okay, so uh, um, as you can see, the line